Thank you so much. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yeah. So this is what happened. Um, early on, we were trying to get a hold of Simon Shama uh, because we wanted to have him be one of the endowed lecturers, and that's a lot of money, and that's really cool. And so I, and he's a friend of mine, and he's a fellow of my institute in New York, and should be easy to get a hold of him, and I started sending him emails, and I started sending him, leaving messages on his answering machine, which said, don't leave any more messages because it's already full. And, uh, and this went on for three months, and finally we, we gave up and we, we chose somebody else. And about three days later, I was in the bank, and my cell phone rang. <laughs> and I picked it I picked it up, I picked it up, I picked it up. <laughs> and there was this voice that said, there was a uh, Baptist and a Roman Catholic priest and a Jew, and <laughs> there always is, there always is, there always is. By, by the way, uh, my, favorite, my favorite moment about cell phones is from no, that you're supposed kosher to musical. To me. You're talking to me. Wait, wait, wait. Kosher musical called Spamalot, where the host comes to the front and says, if you all have cell phones, turn them on, because the show is crap, basically. <laughs> so, so there was a Catholic, there was a priest, there was a Jew, and they had to find out. Why do they always have to find out you know, which religion is best? And they had this idea that in the Adirondacks, where else would they be, that they're going to convert a bear. They're going to convert there. So I say to, to Ren, and he, he has no idea actually what's going to happen next. So, of course, they decide they'll go off and find themselves a bar, and they'll meet back at 4 o'clock, and they will find out, of course, which is the superior religion. Back they come at 4 o'clock. And the Catholic turns to the Baptist and says, so how do you get on? And the Baptist says, well, it was hard, but the word of the Lord, the word of the Lord was within me, and it took fire. And I spake the word of the Lord unto the bear, and lo, the bear caught fire, and I dumped him into the street, and he came to Jesus. How did you get on? And the Catholic said, he said, well, I went the food route. Communion wafers held it up, and uh, the bear finally came to Peter, and they said, so where's Moisha? And at that moment, a figure bloodied and bandaged came stumbling through the undergrowth saying, you know, boys, maybe circumcision wasn't the way to go. <laughs> so I said, Simon, are you telling me you've been out circumcising bears, which is why you haven't called? But that reminds me. I think that should be on my tombstone, but that reminds me. Um, anyway, and so then I told him a joke, and the joke I told him was one that I had heard from Roman Polanski when I was profiling him for The New Yorker. I swear to God, this is 15 years ago, 20 years ago, Roman told me this joke. He, by the way, tells the best Jewish jokes in the world. He does the voices. He's really great. Anyway, so he told, this is Roman Polanski telling me this joke uh, about a, uh, a uh, guy of a certain age in Poland who goes into, uh, in, in, into confession. And, and he says, uh, Father, you won't believe what happened to me. It's, just, it's just incredible. I was walking down the street, and, 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 and this beautiful young woman, she, she gives me this come hither look, and this come hither gaze, and then she follows with the fingers, and I follow her, and she takes me upstairs, and, 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 and she strips me naked, and she strips naked, and we start making love. Father, I haven't made love since Mildred died 15 years ago. It was incredible, and, 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 and this goes on and on, and she says, wait a second, she goes up, and she gets her twin sister, and they're done, and it's incredible. It goes on and on, and, and in three days they hold me there, and it's just, you know, goes on and on. And the priest says, and you're feeling guilty about this. And he says, no, 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 not guilty. He says, Ex excuse me, but, but uh, your voice, I don't recognize that. Are you a, a member of our congregation? And he says, no, no. And, and, and he says, I mean, uh, your accent, I mean, don't take offense, but are, are you a follower of our faith? And he says, no, no. He says, why are you telling me this? I'm telling everyone. <laughs> And then you have the Meshpocha already here. We, uh, <laughs> these are mine, those are Ren's. We thought we needed a high Meshpocha. Uh, so there's the Emperor of Japan, of course, needs to find out who can be the best samurai of all. So he calls to us. Who else? Who else? What? Who else would he? <laughs> the Emperor of Japan, you know, the Mikado. So he, he needs to ask a Chinese, a Japanese, and of course, a samurai, in the Jewish case, Sam on Rai. 
Um, and the, uh, the helper, that's the technical Japanese term, comes on with a beautiful black box inside, is a fly. And first up is the Japanese samurai or what else. And the fly flies around and out comes the sword blade. And two parts to the fly fall down to the floor. The emperor is very impressed. Who wouldn't be? Next comes the Chinese. The Chinese, the samurai seems to be, warrior seems to be very confident, and the second lacquer box is pulled out, and another fly is launched into the courtly air. <laughs> comes the sword. This time, the, the fly falls into four little parts, pat on the floor. And out of the turn of samurai, and a third fly is launched into the air, Swish, swish, goes the sword, and the fly carries on buzzing. And the emperor says, fly carries on buzzing. The emperor says, uh, I, I don't understand. This fly is supposed to be dead. And Samurai says, dead, Shmeb, he's circumcised. You know. <laughs> So there's this tall rabbi and a short rabbi, and they're walking along in Shanghai, actually, come to think of it. Um, and uh, this woman comes racing out, husband, my husband, my husband is dead, he's dead, he's, it's terrible, he's dead. He's, and, 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 and the tall rabbi says, this is terrible, he's dead. She says, what the short rabbi says, let me see, there's something I might be able to do about this. Take me in. And, and the tall rabbi says, this is very bad, you should not be doing this. And, no, no, no. So he goes in, and the corpse is there. And, the, the, uh, and the small rabbi begins to do incantations in Aramaic, in, in ancient Babylonian. He, and with, he goes on and on. He's just whirling dervishes. He's dancing around. And finally, he puts his lips on the corpse's mouth. He says, arise and breathe. And nothing happens. And so then he starts doing circles. He starts circling. He is using potions from the Ethiopian Jews. He's got them. He's got, he's he got things in his pockets. He's just doing everything. He's you know, sprinkling, and he's doing the whole business. And, 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 and he's whirling, and now, now he's doing it in French, and German, and Yiddish, and Ladino. It's just incredible. He's got it going on. And he says, Arise and breathe. Nothing. So one more time, he gets ready. He goes outside, comes back with a knife. He performs a circumcision <laughs> on the corpse. And now he starts whirling and all sorts of stuff. He says, Arise! He does the whole thing. He does it incredible. It gets more and more. It's, it's, it's just incredible. And finally, he puts his lips on the corpse. He says, Arise and breathe! Nothing. And he turns to the tall rabbi. He says, Oi, that's what I call really dead. <laughs> Ida is feeling so good. It's the nursing home. It's her 75th birthday. But boy, does she feel good. She saved the Balenciaga from a moment like this. On goes the Balenciaga. On goes the Galan perfume. On goes the gorgeous makeup. She sachets through the home into the dining hall, saying, super sex, super sex, super sex. And from a deep armchair comes the voice, probably Morty, saying, I'll take the soup. <laughs> Well, they're going to get that way. Um, so this is one my grandfather told me. Um, the, the ship arrives at Ellis Island, and uh, the people get off, and, and there is the long line, and they're set up in line, and the, uh, the, the man you know, is sitting here, and he says, OK, you ask the first guy, he says, do you have any children? And the first guy says, no, I'm sorry. My wife, she is unbearable. <laughs> And, and the guy behind, the guy behind says, oh, please, please, he's a wonderful cobbler. You will see he's a wonderful cobbler. He's just trying to tell you that his wife, she is insurmountable. <laughs> the one behind says, oh, you know, they're both, they're, they're brothers, you know, and he's the good cobbler, and he, he, she's the schmata, it's fantastic, but, but, but you know, it's all, all he's trying to tell you is that his wife, she's inconceivable. <laughs>
he didn't tell you, here's the brothers, all three of them are brothers, very good, very good. English not so good yet. He's just trying to say, your wife is unbearable. Finally, the rabbi comes along and says, you know, they're all great people, they'll be wonderful, wonderful citizens, you'll see it's a great thing. They're just trying to tell you that his wife, she's inscrutable. <laughs> My grandfather told me that one. <laughs> so, yeah, Jews have a hard time with, with sex, as we know, but not always, you know. But if you get into an argument with an Italian or a Frenchman, it could be tricky. So there, such an argument is taking place. And the, 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 the Europeans are bragging, and the Italians said, I know you want some, you look as though you need some advice. And I tell you, what you have to do is actually, what I do is I take some extra virgin olive oil and I smear it all over my wife's body. Schmear, and schmear. she, it's schmear. Italian. <laughs> yeah. And she screams for an hour. It's fantastic. The Frenchman said, oh, please, I don't know. what is this? You say, extra virgin olive oil. We have to do a beurre de Normandy, Normandy butter. It goes all over my wife's body, and she screams for two hours, non-stop. <laughs> and, and the Jew says, you know, that's, that's fine, that's fine. She said, but, but I love to use schmaltz, chicken schmaltz. <laughs> chicken schmaltz goes all over my wife's body, and she screams for six hours, non-stop. And the Italian and the French are very impressed. They said, ah. How, how do you do that? I wipe my hands on the drapes. You know. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna try and take us out of the gutter for a moment, okay? Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell you a story that we were, I was just in New York a couple weeks ago, and we were doing the 20th anniversary of 1989. This isn't exactly a Jewish joke, but it kind of is. Uh, the 20th anniversary of 1989, and Adam Miknik, the great Polish uh, liberation uh, theorist and, and uh, parenthetically Jewish, one of the leaders of Solidarity, and I was asking him uh, why it was that when 1989 happened, uh, under Gorbachev, that communism just evaporated like that. How, what, how did he account for it looking back 20 years later? And he says, well, he says it's the rabbi in the pants. I said, what? He says, hey, the rabbi is having a fight with his wife. Uh, the wife is saying, you know, Shlomo, when are you going to clean those pants? It's, they're so disgusting. They're so dirty. You've worn them for, for months and months and months, and this is ridiculous. And he says, Rebecca, lay off with the complaining about the pants, the, the pants are, you know, there's so much dirt on these pants, there's more dirt than threads at this point. If I were to wash them, they would just disintegrate. And Adam looked at me and said, Gorbachev washed the pants. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's Pesach, as it will be. And, um, you know, it rolls around every year. And Becky has given Moshe his lunch. Cholamoid, it's matzah, naturally. And he goes out into the park. It's a beautiful day, like today. And uh, he's sitting, starting to eat his matzah lunch, and uh, a blind man comes and, white stick, comes and sits next to him, minds his own business. Moshe doesn't, you know, what's that? But you know how it is. If there's someone you have lunch, and somebody else doesn't have lunch, you start to feel kind of uneasy. And he feels uneasier and uneasier. And uh, eventually, he hands over a piece of the matzo to the blind man, and the blind man picks it up and said, who wrote this shit? Can I tell a blind story that has nothing to do with Jewishness? This is a, quick blind, a quick blind story, and then I'll tell a, Jew, a Jewish joke. This is a true story. Alistair Reed, the uh, great translator Borges, tells this story that, that Borges told him. Borges is the great Argentinian uh, writer uh, and was the librarian of Buenos Aires, uh, uh, the National Librarian. And if you've been in Buenos Aires, you know the National Library has this huge set of stairs that come down and eventually you're at Avenida 18 July and it's like two football fields wide. Borges is famously blind. And he would every day come to the edge of the curb and stand waiting because the taxis were on the other side. 
this is true, and he would just wait for somebody to recognize him and take him across the street, this huge, bustling street. He did this every day because on the other side, the taxis would drive him anywhere in Buenos Aires and, and, and never charge him. So, uh, so one day, he's standing there, and a man takes his arm, and they go across the street, and this is true. The guy says to him on the far side, Thank you so much, sir. It's so rare nowadays for somebody to help a blind man across the street. <laughs> but that wasn't my joke. Now I have to do a Jewish joke. That's good. So here's a Jewish joke about uh, this rabbi uh, right around the turn of the millennium named Jesus. And he's walking along, and suddenly there's this woman in tattered clothes just goes racing by him. And, and, and this, all these pebbles and stones are hurling by him. Suddenly this mob yelling, harlot, harlot, harlot. And, 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 and Reb Jesus says, you know, every stop, stop. What is this? Let he among you who is without sin cast the first stone. And the crowd is abashed, like you guys. It's really a big heavy number. And suddenly, from the back of the crowd, this boulder goes hurling through the air, <laughs> lands squat on the girl. She's a Kimbo with legs, and then the boulder on top of her. And Jesus looks to the back and says, Oh, Mom, you're always ruining everything. <laughs> <laughs> so a woman goes into uh, the office of the Jewish newspaper, Jewish Chronicle in my hometown, London, that said, my Moshe, he, you know, he's passed on. I need to write an obituary. So he said, yes, yes. So he said, what will it say? Moshe is dead. And the clerk says, that's it? She said, Moshe is dead. He said, well, you know, Mrs. Garfinkel, but it's a five-word minimum. She thinks, she says, hmm. Moshe is dead. Volvo for sale. <laughs> We have a lot of death and sex. Anyway, um, so uh, this is another one that Adam told me, Adam Micknick. Mm -hmm. It's actually an amazing situation. We were in South Africa, and uh, this was during the campaign for the, the ANC presidency, uh, when, when, and, and Albie Sachs, the great freedom fighter there, uh, asked whether we wanted to go along to a campaign up, appearance that he was going to be doing, trying to get people to vote for the ANC. And he was going to Clifton, which is kind of the the Jewish district in, in Cape Town, and we went with him. This is not part of the judge, this is all set up. And he, by the way, uh, he's been here before, and you all know, many of you know him. He, had a, he himself suffered from a bomb explosion. Uh, they tried to kill him, and he had a, uh, has a stump for one arm, and he plays it like a Stradivarius with the sleeve going up and down, and he's trying to convince the, 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 this group uh, of, of, of Jews all of them of a certain age in, in, in Cape Town, that they should vote for the ANC in the coming election, even though the ANC likes the PLO. And he basically says, the reason you have to vote for us is that together, you know, we're going to make this country work again, and your children will come back from Chicago and Paris and, and, and so forth, and they'll come back here where they belong. And Adam Micknick leaned over to me and said, it, 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 it's the Belgian army joke come to life. I said, Belgian army, so he proceeds to tell me the Belgian army joke. The Belgian army joke is the Belgians are at each other's throats. The army is falling apart. You, 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 you know this history. The, the Flemish and the Walloons are at each other's throats. It's completely insane. They're all you know, fighting and so forth. And finally, the general arrives at the barracks and says, everybody stop, what is this? Everybody stop, that's one of my key lines here. Everybody stop, what is this? Okay, Walloons over on this side, Flemish over on this side. Enough of this. And, so, and there's one man left standing in the middle of the room. And he goes up and he says, so, private, what are you? And he says, me, sir, I'm a Belge. And he says, and what is your name? Rabinowitz, sir. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm trying to raise the level here. And if you guys just keep oh, laughing oh, at the sex oh, jokes, we'll go back to sex jokes. I'll be, <laughs> ne my next joke is oh, a sex joke. Oh, okay. Okay, okay so <laughs> Rabinowitz phones his mother, you know, so. And she says, so, so, mother, how are you? She said, I'm all right. And said, no, really, I can hear not so good. I said, well, to tell you the truth, I haven't eaten for 38 days. I said, 38 days, mother? I said, why? I said, I should have my mouth full when you might call? <laughs> Psh. 
That was a short one. You can, you, you can do, I want you to do another one right now because you're going to forget it. Okay, 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 okay. Well, then I'm going to, well, this is when you all know, but, and so you're not going to laugh. I'm really setting myself up. This is not a sex joke. And I'm, again, I'm trying to raise the level here. So please, please, and if they don't laugh, you laugh, okay? <laughs> You, they all know this one, but you know, the one about the guy who, uh, uh, the, the grandmother who takes the children to the beach? Do you want to tell it? Don't ask them. <laughs> Don't ask them. They'll know. The grandmother takes this the children. This is true. Wait a minute, wait a minute. It's, it's somewhere in some, you know, in some miscellany, jokes about jokes, really, which we, is not a good way to go. But it says, well, you know, how often does a peasant laugh? He laughs three times. Once when he told a joke, once when you explain it, and third time when you understand it. Um, when, do, when do Jews laugh? You're the exception to this. Never, because they'll say, I've heard it before, and beside you don't tell it so good. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so the grandmother takes the children, her, her, the grand, her grandchild, to the beach, and this huge wave comes up and swallows the child. <laughs> child screaming. <laughs> out, out to sea. <laughs> Gone. You can't even hardly hear the screams anymore. But you can still hear them a little bit. <laughs> and now you don't hear them. <laughs> <laughs> Not everybody gets to tell a joke with a, uh, a boombox. So that, that, that helps. And so the grandmother falls on her knees. Oh my God, my daughter's going to kill me. This, oh my God, this is horrible, horrible. This is the most horrible thing. And oh God, please, God. And she falls on her knees. She says, God, please. He was such a young boy. He was going to be on the debate team, and it was wonderful, and, and he was so, and he said, you should see, he was so good with the handwriting, was oh, please, please, please have mercy, bring him back. And suddenly, there's this huge wave. <laughs> and there's the boy. <laughs> and she looks up at heaven, and she said, he was wearing a cap. <laughs> <laughs> so Sam comes home, <laughs> lowering the tone again, and Sadie is just crying her eyes out. Sadie, what? I know, I know, you've been, you've been wildcatting, you've been doing things with the secretary of yours, it's disgusting. And she says, oh, Sadie, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. But I must tell you something, you know, there's something wrong with our life in the bedroom. And Sadie, what, Sex what, can, that, what can that be? <laughs> and he says, you know, it's just, I couldn't tell you, but now I have to tell you, you never moan, you never moan. And if you only moaned, I'd give up the secretary, oh, every, you know, it would be just, just fine. And she says, okay, okay Sam, I'll, I'll moan. And so Sam's very excited that night in the bedroom, and he goes, fantastic, and, oh, and, uh, oh, <laughs> no. yeah, yeah, and she says, um, you know, she just gets in the bed, she says, now, now shall I motion? No, 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 no. And he starts, you know, wonderful Jewish foreplay, not entirely an oxymoron. Um, <laughs> and, And it's getting going on very well. And, and Sadie says, shall, shall I moan now? And he says, no, 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 no. And it's fantastic. And he's just about to come. And he says, now moan, moan. And she says, oi, what a morning I've had. You should only know. I had several jokes of great social and historical relevance. <laughs> and I'm not going to waste them on you. <laughs> so the 16-year-old boy goes to the rabbi, Peach Fuzzil, very nervous. And he goes to the rabbi and says, Rabbi, you know, next week is the marriage. And I'm very confused about the work that we're going to do. I mean. So, so let me see if I have this straight. After we break the glass, is, is, is that when the sex happens? And the rabbi says, no, no, first we have the dinner. And he says, OK, after the dinner, is that when the sex happens? He says, no, 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 no. First we have the speeches. He says, 
Okay. And after the speech, it says, that when the sex happens? And the therapist says, that's when the sex happens. The boy is quiet for a second. He says, about the sex, um, am, am, I'm, I'm a little bit unclear. Am I allowed to be on top of her? Ah, oh, yeah, this is wonderful. This is one of the great ways. This is very, very good. God loves this. Is she allowed to be on top of me? Oh, this is God. This is a great mitzvah. This is wonderful, wonderful. And, and some of the boys in the yeshiva were talking about oral. Is this even allowed? Oh, this is fantastic. Me on her? Yeah. Oh, great, great. God looks on this. is great. Her on me? Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And, 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 and back at the farm, the, the dogs, is that a great? Oh, Wonderful, wonderful. This is, God just thinks this is one of the great, great things, he says. And, and, and can we do it standing up? No! <laughs> Absolutely not. Are you, are you, young man, are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? Standing up? Are you crazy? This is so disgusting. This, where, where, did, where did you, where do you learn this stuff? Where, who gives you these ideas standing up? This is completely disgusting. I, this is so tough, I can't even believe it. And the boy says, but, 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 but what's wrong with standing up? And the rabbi says, you start having sex standing up, and before you know it, you're going to be dancing. And my <laughs> <laughs> so Abe and Moshe are passing by a church, and um, there's a sign outside that says uh, twenty dollars if you if you convert. And they're a little hard up. Time, times are hard. And they said, "Who's who's gonna know? You know, it's my." You know. And uh, Moshe thinks, "No, you can't to convert." Uh, no, don't think about it. It's not good. Not good. It'll be punished, you know. It's going to be terrible. And he says, but you know, I'm sorry, lost my job, you know. It's, Sarah, she's pregnant again. You know, I just, it, it, you know, God will forgive me. So he nips into the church, comes out 15 minutes later, and um, he's, you know, smiling away. And Abe says to him, um, so did you? You get the twenty dollars. That's all you think about, you Jews. Money, money, money. <laughs> so, if you, some of you got this from, uh, are here um, on the basis of the program, and I was really a minor <laughs> character in the program. I really wanted to get off stage because you're really here to hear Simon. Uh, one more joke, actually. Is this, I'm detecting a wind up here. Yeah, actually. okay, okay. So he has one, one more joke. He's going to tell one more joke, and then we'll before, be. Before we. Before, you, before, before you get we have the lecture, before the series. The hard stuff. So, Jew and the non Jew are in the, in the Rolls Royce. It's the non Jew's Rolls Royce, of course, when they're, and they're driving past the Grand Shul, Emmanuel, in New York. And um, a non -Jew, non Jew said, Tell me, he said, You know, you Jews have the most wonderful festivals. What, what is this? Uh, uh, Rosh Hashanah, and um, what, what is it you do exactly? And um, the Jew says, well, we blow the chauffeur. And he says, my God, you people are good to your stuff. <laughs> That's, that's, that's a little bit like the guy, this is not a Jewish show, but that's like the guy who, who arrives. Please. The, the guy who arrives uh, at, at, in town and he's, uh, he, he remembers his, his, uh, his uh, before he gets home, he, his wife wanted him to pick up fish at the fish market and he, this is not Jewish, but, 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 but uh, and, uh, and you know, he's really concerned if he got to do it before and it's on the freezer, he better do it. So he asked the taxi driver, can you tell me where in this town I can get scrod? And the taxi driver says, I've never heard that in the blue perfect subjunctive. <laughs> but I was starting to say that some of you came here under the mistaken impression that you'd actually hear a lecture from Mr. Shama on, <laughs> Professor Shama on the theme of uh, Jewish We don't do refunds, it's a Jewish lecture. You know, and all I can say before handing over the program to him is, you know the difference between the British and the Jews, right? Yeah, the British always leave without saying goodbye. The Jews always say goodbye without leaving. 
I give you the, uh, the guy who's not saying goodbye, but I am. So we'll have you, we'll have you a good time. We're, we're nearly done. So this, this is the college course part of it. But you know, is it me or sometimes there are certain words in the language which aren't, but seem like Yiddish, you know, like lentil, you know? I mean, <laughs> garnish, you know, <laughs> far-fetched, <laughs> gotta be here, moist, you know, so you can do it, you know, how far-fetched is it to do a moist garnish with your lentil? Entirely in Shalom Aleichem, purely. I suppose this is all, all because, really, the first Hebrew teacher I ever had was called Sammy Kramer. He was, he was wonderful. And I can't remember much about Chumash and Siddur, except Sammy's very bad jokes, actually. It was mostly, my cheder education was mostly a series of bad jokes, the most famous one. And it is very bad. It's not this kind of superior, milty, George Burns stuff we, we've been doing. Say goodnight, Ren. Um, is, is, uh, he said, why did the prophet Isaiah wear a monocle? And the answer was, because one Isaiah than the other, you know. And that, it, was great if you were, it was great if you were 10 years old. Um, but this issue of kind of Jewish jokes, you know, I mean, it would have, you know, there were all sorts of jokes. Sort of, I mean, is it jokes about Jews? Or is there something to the fact that there are such things as Jewish jokes? Maybe, maybe I haven't made up my mind. I mean, you never actually quite know you know, I mean, you reckon you know about what a Jewish joke is or what really Jewish culture is. But then, in you know, 150 years, when Ren is still running the Chicago Festival brilliantly, uh, but we no, we no longer have names at all. We just have numbers. And these two people meet, and they sit down opposite each other. They've been introduced at one of the great parties, and one says, "Oh, nine four three six two one seven," and the other one says, "Eight nine three two four." And the first one says, funny, you don't look Jewish. You know, it's all... <laughs> you, never really quite, you never really quite know. Um, and there are attempts... You know, here's the thing. It's no good. Jewish humor's got to be quite recent, hasn't it? I mean, it's no good looking in the Bible for, you know, gags, really. Um, even though people have done it. There, was, there actually was an article when I was thinking about this... There was actually an article by someone, you know, some learned Presbyterian of Boston called George Parker Downs um, about the wit of the Bible. It was a really short article, I have to say. <laughs> but I see someone was giving a talk on, on the book of Job that, you know, I mean, the book of Job really, you know, is a bundle of wisecracks. We have to really sort of sick sense of humor to think it's really <laughs> killing, I suppose, killingly funny. It, it might be. Um, and you know, the thing about the Bible, the reason why it's not very funny is the Bible isn't really, or is it me, it's not really very Jewish, is it? It's, it's Jew-ish, really. <laughs> it belongs to us. But it's peculiar, it's not like, you know, Shalom Aleichem and afterwards, really. Um, so it's sort of not surprising. There is one peculiarly bizarre moment. You know, Yitzchak means laughter. And um, Sarah, of course, calls Yitzhak because she's pregnant at 80, really, which is no joke, you know, at all. Um, it's the only kind of, and, you know, Jehovah is not really a kind of gagmeister in any particular way. Um, the New Testament really, you know, it has, again, despite the love Jesus, you know, I love that, but, you know, that, wouldn't, that, that was a gospel according, the, the, the mysteriously missing gospel according to the book of Wren, you know, the Apostle Wren. Um, but I, that's why Monty Python has such fun in the life of Brian, blessed are the cheesemakers and so on. Uh, there is potential for later humor in the New Testament. Um, you know, the, or the old joke, you'll, you'll uh, know, how do we know that Jesus was Jewish? Because he thought his mother was a virgin, he went into his father's business, you know. Uh, <laughs> they're all... Uh, but it's, sort of, it's a sign that, you know, Jewish humor is gutsier now, really, when a friend of mine says, you know, in a response, actually, to a long tradition of anti-Semitism, really, about, you know, the Gentiles giving us a really hard time for, um, you know, the crucifixion. And said, so, yeah, what's the big deal? He's only dead for two days. You know, really. <laughs> The theory of laughter, really, there is a classical theory of laughter. Scholars, have people been talking about 
Democritus, that barrel of gags, actually, uh, Democritus of Abdera, there is a classical theory of laughter, and it is curiously, um, you know, sort of unsympathetic, actually. I mean, it goes all the way back to Aristotle noticed, as did Plato, but Aristotle was the first person to really talk about this, that, that we're the only animal that both laughs and cries. And Aristotle also noticed it was a kind of involuntary, what you've been doing, involuntary, not say coerced, you know, convulsion, a sort of odd grimace that comes across us when we laugh. So the classical theory um, is really uh, quite cruel. It is really that we laugh, actually, when we see ugliness or deformity, um, and so there's always an element of contempt or derision or hatred in the laughter. And that theory that we actually laugh at other people's misfortunes is peculiarly antithetical to you know, what it is we like to think you know, when we make fun of ourselves, as Jews really often do. The classical theory, it's quite true that actually when people comment, Caesar, for example, that bundle of laughs, um, actually talks also about the laugh and entirely in terms of ridicule, as does Cicero and De Oratore. Um, and there are commentaries in the Renaissance, for example, Girolamo Francastoro, 1546, um, actually does say, well, you know, laughter actually can simply be pleasant. It can actually simply be an expression of joy. But it's extraordinary how much minority view that is among the Goyim. And um, Thomas Hobbes, for example, most famously, um, says, actually, of the passion of laughter is nothing else but a sudden glory arising from a sudden conception of our eminency in ourselves by comparison with the infirmities of, each, uh, of others. And this sort of sense of a, a sudden moment, a sudden glory, a sudden conception of glory. And it's sweetest. It really is a sort of a heart moment, actually. And, you know, translated into Jewish jokes, it suddenly becomes warmer and cuddlier, I think, actually. Like, uh, some of them are kind of long-winded jokes, but why not? You're all trapped in this place. And this is a joke my father loved this, because it's actually sort of true, more or less, of Jewish restaurants in London, as it must be in New York, too. The sort of places, there was a famous place, Blooms, in the East End of London, where you would show up and the, and the waiters would greet you with saying, sit there till I'm ready. Fantastic, you know, it's absolutely true. So a man goes into the, the restaurant, and he, Mr. Goldberg, and he's always had the same thing every, every single day for sort of 36 years. And, the, the, you know, it's always chicken soup, matzo ball soup, and, um, and it's followed by baked clops. It's always the same. So eventually, when he's allowed to sit down, the waiter brings him the soup, and Goldberg sits there, sits there, doesn't do anything at all. And the waiter says, comes over and says, Goldberg, eat your soup, it's getting cold. And Goldberg says, Taste the soup. He says, uh, no, I, don't, I don't need to, Goldberg. I, it's the same soup. You've been coming here every day for 36 years. It's the same soup. You always have the chicken soup, the mozzarella ball soup. It's the soup. I don't need to taste. He said, taste the soup. He said, I'm, Goldberg, I know I'm the waiter, but I'm going to get really annoyed with you if you're going to actually have your lunch. The clops are waiting once you've had your soup. He says, taste the soup. So the waiter said, I, oh, right. Where's the spoon? Aha. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's the sudden glory. That's the sort of reversal of, uh, of expectations, you know, where actually you can score off someone like, like the, the circumcised fly. But Jewish humor, I think, actually, you know, most, most of the people who write about it think, and Freud, oh God, if you, if you, you know, it's the, the, the worst thing about actually discussing laughter is, you know, 400 pages long is when you really don't have any good jokes at all. There is one quite good one in Freud. Maybe all of you have kind of read it before coming here and know and really think the other ones. There's one actually he tells via Heine, Heinrich Heine, that famous gagmeister, um, you know, all the, all the German romantics, probably even, you know, the shortest funny book is the kind of wit of George Friedrich Wilhelm Hegel, really. That was a real <laughs> absolute gas. But Heine talks about actually how the Roth, he said, talks about the Rothschild, and the Rothschild treated me, um, he says, familiarement. You know, that's it, in a familiar way, and, but as a millionaire. Anyway, Freud thinks this is so funny, you know. Freud can barely write from wetting himself, you know, but he thinks it's so funny. I, the Rothschild jokes, actually, this is not a joke, it's a real story. I worked for a Rothschild once, out of a shalom, Victor, hoy. And um, one time, I, we, I, I worked on an archive that he owns. This is true, Rent. I've told you this one. And 
he would always, he'd always kind of slightly bully me, where is the next chapter, where is the next chapter, and one time, um, and he would do this between glasses of irresistible claret, and um, he sort of pounded his fist on the table, <coughs> exactly, and said, Simon, he had a very deep voice, made deeper by his Abdullah cigarettes, he said, you, my, you know what our family motto is, and for that minute, I couldn't, I couldn't remember the roster, our motto was terrible, he said, service, and by God, we get it. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs Heiner, you know, really, for nothing could be Heiner. Um, so, Freud goes on, but there's one okay joke, so it's a Shadchan joke, you know. So, Shadchan brings a young man in to see the prospect, and the bride is terrifying, you know, the prospect, the, the prospective bride is sort of, she's ugly, and she's got a squint, and she's lame, and she's very old, and she's very ugly, and, um, and the young man says, well, well, why did you bring me here? She's old, she's lame, she's squint, she's ugly, and, uh, no, he says, <laughs> got that wrong, he says, she's, she's old, she's lame, she's squinting, and the Shadchan says, you learn need to lower your voice, she's deaf, too. You know, it was... <laughs> I ruined that one for you. But one in 25 isn't, isn't so bad. So Freud says, well, Jewish... He doesn't actually think there is Jewish humor, as a matter of fact. I mean, he thinks the jokes in a relation to the unconscious is all about release mechanisms, defensiveness, and so on. And you can apply it, though, without much difficulty, really, to the rise of Jewish humor in, in both Europe and, the, uh, and in the... Uh, in the um, you know, in the Anglo-Saxon world, um, because actually what Jews do, what they did characteristically in the great days of Catskill stand-ups, is to kind of preempt, you know, preempt all the accusations, really, about them with, with their own jokes um, about avarice, for example. So, you know, like the three, um, the Protestant, the Catholic, and the Jew, who really, um, you know, who are sitting there, really, in the park, and the hooker comes to them, and Hooker says, and they're all gentlemen of the cloth, there's a rabbi, a priest, and a minister, and it says, uh, gentlemen, I've led a terrible life, I need to repent, and, and the way I must repent is, is I, will, I will do anything for you, and especially because I feel so contrite, for $25, and they suddenly look very excited, and the Catholic priest said, says, $25 anything? She says, absolutely anything, he says, oh, I'll see you in the hotel around the corner a little bit, and and, uh, and, and the Presbyterian says, absolutely anything. He says, just anything, anything to do. What would you like me to do? He said, well, I'll tell you, you know, sort of. Um, and uh, he says, right, well, I'll, I'll, I'll see you in the afternoon. And uh, the Jew says, you'll, you'll, is this true? You'll do absolutely anything for $25? She says, anything you like. She says, paint the house. You know, but, <laughs> And that kind of show gets through, you know, the accusations which we're accused of, or the infirmities and deformities of the Jews. Like, there are nine people upstairs in a little shtibel, and the rabbi says, we've only, got, we've only got nine, we've only got nine. Just lean out of the window and see if you can find a tenth for the minyan. And the only problem is that Habertson is past her prime, and she's not looking so good, she's like the bride in the, in the Freud joke. She's not, not a very pink. She leans out, and she finally sees someone coming along and says, do you want to be the tenth man? He says, oh, yeah, I don't even want to be the first. You know. <laughs> so Jewish humor rises, really, from a sense of sticking together, you know, sort of some deflecting, really, the accusations against us, really, with our own sense of kind of preemptive, jokey self-criticism. And another, another really thing which I absolutely love, and it happens really in other forms, too, um, time is getting on, is the, is the gluing together of uh, inappropriate things that don't really belong together. And this, this can happen in, in music, as well. And uh, my favorite, you'll, you'll all remember him, um, and he was really wonderful at doing this, is, uh, was, uh, you know, the, the great but sort of uh, sad and ultimately suicidal Alan Sherman. And, um, and I thought I couldn't get this to captive audience go without actually giving you my favorite, Alan, inappropriate. And it's both really, it doesn't undo 
in this case, the Battle Hymn of the Republic. It adds something to it, really, which is about us, which is sort of preemptively but sweetly defensive. So, I'm singing you a ballad of a great man of the cloth. His name was Harry Lewis, and he worked for Irvin Roth. He died while cutting velvet on a hot July the 4th, but his cloth goes shining on. Glory, glory, Harry Lewis. Glory, glory, Harry Lewis. Glory, glory, hallelujah, his cloth goes shining on. Now Harry Lewis perished in the service of his lord. He was trampling through the warehouse where the drapes of wrath were stored. He had the finest funeral that the company could afford, and his cloth was shining on. Glory, glory, hallelujah! Glory, glory, hallelujah! Glory, glory, hallelujah! His cloth was shining on. Though the flames were raging, Harry stood by high his machine. When the fireman found him, he was lying between a pile of toasted backcorn and some French fried gabardine. But his cloth goes shining on everybody. Glory, glory, Harry Lewis. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, Harry Lewis. His cloth goes shining on. The wonderful song stylings of Mr. Simon Shama and Mr. Yuri Lane. Thank you all.